everybody and welcome back to the Beer Ladies podcast. I apologize, I don't have much of a voice this week. Um, as, as some will know, we were, out, um, we were out with the Beer Lady Society over the last weekend and we, we had a bender. So um, it's, it's the first day that my voice has somewhat come back and uh, so you'll just have to deal with my raspiness um, and I'm sure the rest will have their own stories to tell. Um, but anyway, welcome back. We are back in podcast land, and today we are kind of doing the very opposite of the Reinheitsgebot. So we are um, finishing off uh, or rounding out our ingredient series by talking about the thing that most people don't really add to their beer, but actually you'd be surprised how many do, and that is adjuncts. It's a very big family of ingredients and maybe even processes or methods we'll see as we go but we're going to go through them we're going to tell you besides the usuals of barley and yeast and hops and water what you can add to beer and why you might do it and we'll even go through a couple of really well-known beers that you might recognize but before we do that and before we get into uh, what are you drinking i'm just going to remind everybody there please to do the usuals like us on the social medias we are at beer ladies pod most places beer ladies podcast where we're not and we always appreciate a bit of a message or a share and um, a review on apple podcasts or any of the other podcatchers and if you want to see our faces instead of just listen to our voices you can always catch us on youtube and then very lastly there are two ways main ways that you can support the podcast besides just being a regular listener and that is the first is buying us a coffee or a beer so to speak and that is at buy me a beer no buy me a coffee haha <laughs> forward slash beer ladies podcast and the second is our merch which is i'm just showing to the camera there i've got a hoodie on. um oh i love it and it's not so brand new but it's new enough and we'd love to spot some of you at uh at all the upcoming beer festivals and some beer ladies merch so Check the show notes below, but it is Beer Ladies Podcast with hyphens in between dot my spread shop dot IE. It's on our socials. Listen. There we go. It's on our socials. It's in the show notes. Follow the links. Don't listen to me. Righto. So ladies, we're going to talk about adjuncts. Do any of us have beers that have got adjuncts in them? Woohoo. Okay. Hands up. Three <laughs> out of four. Three out of four. <laughs> so just so that everybody knows, we do have Lisa and Erica and Carolyn today. And Carolyn, since you don't have an adjunct in your beer, I'm going to leave you to last. Let's start with Lisa. So thank you. I have a Whiplash Melted, which is a Roggen beer. Um, I'm apologizing for my terrible, terrible German, but what's unusual or the, what's adjuncty, I guess, about this one is that it has rye in it. So it's, uh, it's definitely got a lovely sort of bready flavor uh bready not bretty that's a very different thing but uh I, I was saying before we started i had actually kind of put off having this one because i sometimes the rye can be a little bit of a an almost sharp flavor but this is really lovely very rounded so uh recommend uh so well done erica and team <laughs> <laughs> lovely one so erica what have you got today uh so i went with uh never cursed uh which is the whiplash grisette and it has two adjuncts in it being wheat malts and oat malts, um, along with its regular malts and hot bill uh, listed right here on the label. Wonderful. So Carolyn, before we get to you, I've got a, I've got a Berliner Weiss that's dry hopped with gooseberries and it's called Goosebumps. There's my can. It actually looks a bit like a Paddy's Day beer. It looks very yeah, it does. Very, right nice. <laughs> very green and festive. And I couldn't, oh, the, the brewery is, I don't know how to pronounce it or say it, but it's B-R-L-O. I guess they're from Germany. So there we go. Very cool. And I love gooseberries. So I'm pretty happy to have something delicious and fruity. All right, Carolyn, what have you got? What are you drinking today? Sorry, my cat decided to stick his paw in my beer and I thought it was cute. So, <laughs> make sure. So, please excuse me. Uh, I'm drinking El Grito Lager by uh, Four Corners. And I like the can. It has like a rooster on it oh, on cool. both sides. I don't know. I mean, I like to buy stuff because cool. cans are cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Don't ever overlook the can design. Yes. Well, it's kind of interesting that you've got a lager because lagers are one of the styles that adjuncts are really common in. So Erica, are you going to tell us now, what, what is, do we even have a definition of what an adjunct <laughs> is? <laughs> um, 
Well, I will start with the Institute of Brewing and Distilling in London's definition, um, which is an adjunct as any carbohydrate source other than malt that contributes fermentable sugars to the wort. Um, and kind of, as you were saying with the Reinheitsgebot earlier, um, Nancy Holst Poland and Mark W. Patterson uh, define adjuncts as any ingredient added to beer that isn't malted barley, hops, water, or yeast. Um, so I had um, a class with Will Keating um, during my third year of my most recent degree, and he gave a lecture on adjuncts. Um, and I was just going to briefly cover some of the things that he likes um, brewers to consider um, before they put adjuncts into beer. Uh, so looking at the taste and the chemical stability um, is really crucial for the quality. Uh, thinking about how easy are these adjuncts to handle? Um, do you need special equipment um, to use them? Um, are there any savings on the extract? Uh, so basically like economical reasons. Uh, thirdly, uh, I think this is really key as well is public image um, because there may be some backlash or some misunderstandings in terms of commercials. So declaring the, all the ingredients on the label is something that breweries should do to say like what type of product it is because as you know, uh, there may be people who are vegan or have special dietary requirements or allergies, and these can often be adjuncts. And then lastly is legal. Uh, as you said with the Ryan Heights go boat, um, there may be like a governmental restriction or law on the use of adjuncts. So those would be like the four things uh, he suggests mm. that we in the brewing industry think about. Uh, and then before we kind of delve into the different kinds of adjuncts and why and how we use them, I'll just cover uh, Will's list of benefits for using adjuncts. Some of these would be cost, control of fer fermentability, flavor, well, addition or diluent, really, you could go either way with that one coloring material, brew house extender, nitrogen diluent, head enhancer or extender, and high gravity brewing. So just from my own personal opinion, I love trying new and different beers and things that are exciting and interesting. And I think these often include adjuncts and I, I would never say like they're a bad thing or you should look down upon them. Like. I, since living in Ireland, I have porridge with my breakfast every day, and I've really come to love oat and oatmeal and, you know, breakfast stouts, oatmeal stouts. So I think there's definitely a place for them in, in the market. And I'm wearing a scarf that has different uh, brewing grains and hops, and it even has some wheat in there. So coming from a, a farming background in Minnesota, I'm very proud of wheat and oats and buckwheat in particular. And yeah, I've just learned a lot just from, you know, the research that we've done in this episode and look forward to hearing what you guys have to say about adjuncts. Mm. So Lisa, I know you're going to tell us a little bit about how, how we got here and what the perception of adjuncts is, but I might just quickly go through just a little bit of a category tree of the different kinds of adjuncts that we get. So I'm not going to necessarily speak about when to use them just yet, but just in general. So the broad strokes are we get cereals or grains. So we, we call these adjuncts because they're not malted barley and they're not, you know, traditional, and I'm saying this in air quotes, but the sort of traditional brewing grains. So these are things like rice, corn, and um, torrified or flaked wheat and oats. So there are different processes of getting those, um, those starches out. Things like unmalted barley. So when we talk about traditional brewing grains, we're talking about malted barley, not unmalted, but we're also talking about things like sorghum and we've said oats and then of course rye. So all of these different cereals will give us different things in, in 
in our beer. So for instance, something like um, something like wheat would give us better head retention. Something like oats would give us a smooth, silky flavor, but um, or a mouthfeel. But those are the kind of the grains or the cereals. Then we talk a lot about fruit, fruit and spices to a large degree. So fruit and spices, and everybody I think knows something like a fruited sour, or maybe you've had something like a black forest stout that's got cherries in it. Um, so as soon as you're adding fruit, you're doing the same thing as with a grain, you're adding some kind of fermentable sugar, but what you're hoping for is the flavor and color that comes from that fruit or from that spice. Recently, I had a pickle beer, which was really interesting, <laughs> and it had dill in it. So there we go. That would have been an adjunct, so we think. Um, then there are things like sweets and desserts and weird stuff, like donuts and biscuits and chocolate. And, you know, think of um, pastry starts and all these like rich desserty things. People have often brewed stuff with actual donuts and actual chocolate. So these are very possible. We might include things like coffee in there and tea. People have brewed tea um, before. So almost other confections or other foods. Um, and then probably the last one, is it the last one? Maybe, but sugars. So other kinds of sugars. Um, notably in Belgian brews, we're talking here about Belgian candy syrup, which is obviously a very rich and um, concentrated um, syrup made of sugars and various things and it's almost like a caramel that you add and um, but we can also talk about honey and we can talk about just adding extra sugar so we can talk about table sugar coconut sugar whatever you want and um, but sugars as a whole is another kind of adjunct if if we believe that all of them are adjuncts that is right and this is such an interesting distinction because uh, you know i was I had to stop and think because I've got, you know, a couple of, you know, beers with, with fruit in them in my fridge, but I thought, oh, will these count? Again, air quotes, because is it that they're adding flavor or is it that they're adding a fermentable sugar? And is that the definition? And I think there's not agreement. If you look in the brewing literature, some people say anything that's not, you know, one of these sort of central four things is an adjunct, again, air quotes, but others are like, no, no, it's only if it's from, you know, the, the malted or unmalted grain, you know, again, but it's, it's, people don't seem to agree on this. So, but, but out of an abundance of caution, I did say, okay, I'll get the beer with the rye just, just to be on the safe side. But I think it's a really interesting question. And, and, you know, I've had a beer brewed with Cheerios, which was glorious. I have to say it was so, so, so good, but I mean, that had to be an adjunct, even though in that case, it was purely fermentable sugar, but it's interesting. And, and I did have a conversation with someone I, like, and this was at a beer festival over a beer brewed with tea where they argued, and this is a real conversation I had with obviously a man, <laughs> that um, that this was not an adjunct because they basically used the tea as effectively dry hopping and therefore not an adjunct. And then I was like, my dude, no normal person cares, you know, th there's <laughs> either a flavor or not. But um, I, I think, uh, well, I, think I made him are. feel bad um but it was a really interesting beer so you know again for the tea example it, it can work but is it magic it I mean, is, why not it is interesting because there's also there's different times of of your beer making process yes. that you can add something and that may also help us get to a better definition if that's what we were after so something like tea or something like um coconut or a lot of fruit is often added at the end like mm. almost as a dry hop but mm -hmm. i'd argue that it does add flavor even if it's not fer fermentable in the traditional oh, sense. Yeah. So for me, that would be an adjunct. I'd say. Yeah, I mean, I had like a cucumber lime sour the other day and I was like, I'm not sure how I feel about this. And he put this thing called tahine on it. He's like, trust me, you're gonna like oh. it. And I was like, oh, okay, I see why. Oh, heck but yeah, like, tahine, love but it. But like, yeah. yeah, cause like that goes what at the end, right? For, so I would consider that an adjunct beer. Would I consider this a lager beer? I mean, this lager beer an adjunct? I mean, it says, citrus flavors so i mean i'm assuming they're putting more than just i mean it could come from the hops but it, it may not you know mm -hmm. it'll depend on what's in those ingredients yeah yeah and no normally they i mean they should say it because i think people have got allergies to certain grains yeah um but but normally i think people normally think about adjuncts as just grains as opposed to fruits and spices and sugars and syrups and all the other things but yeah, I'd, I'd argue that everything is. That being said, um, Erica, before we came on, you were telling us about a beer that uses oak chips mm -hmm. um, in it. I, 
for me, that would maybe not be an adjunct, although it does contribute to flavor. Is that weird? Yeah, like, I guess because the chips themselves were removed from the beer, like, I, I would mm. maybe wonder if there's, like, a processing aid sort of sub-definition. Um, oh, maybe. Interesting. Like, it's, it's so subjective and hard to tell, uh, as so much of beer and brewing is, really. Um, like, <laughs> um, I was about I mean, to say that. I was about to say, is it that? Isn't everything subjective? <laughs> um whereas like if we're adding lime zest in the hopper Mm. as a dry hop like I would say yes absolutely like to me there's no question that that would be an adjunct um Mm. yeah Mm. and I think your point about you know the labeling because of course especially with allergies or uh the one I think of a lot is is grapefruit where you could be getting that flavor from the hops but if you have people who are on like lots of really common medications, grapefruit mm-hmm. can inter, you know, can interfere with those or cause bad reactions. So yeah. if it's grapefruit flavor from the hop, it's probably fine. But if there's grapefruit zest or something else, you want to call that out for people. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's not always clear depending on where, you know, your can or bottle was labeled. So. Yeah. yeah. And I, and also um, any sort of like milk stout or milkshake mm. IPA, like having lactose in there, like if yeah. someone were lactose intolerant as well. So yeah, like I would see no reason not to be transparent, I guess. Um, yeah. And mm. it kind of brings us back to an episode that we had earlier this season on pumpkin ales. And I mean, vegetables would maybe be another sort of subcategory of adjuncts. Mm-hmm. Um, I was actually just thinking that besides the the reasons to add an adjunct for flavor or for fermentability or all of the other reasons, I've I've always thought that people might add adjuncts to also remove something. So for instance, adding mm. corn or rice into a lager would typically thin out the body. Um, but for me, it, it might also have thinned out the amount of gluten in the beer, making sure. it more tolerable for people with gluten allergies or intolerances. I wonder if that's the case. That's just my suspicion. Mm. Well, that was probably just due to cost, because as we know, Things like corn and rice are typically called fillers and yeah. they're they're typically cheaper than malted barley. So most of the time I'd say people are using them for cost, but maybe the happy side effect is um, sure. reduced gluten. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um like I, I was thinking about our ch- our talk with Jesse from Quaza and yeah. you know their use of sorghum and mm. you know that being uh, a cereal that doesn't have gluten. Um so there could absolutely be you know, positive side effects, or, you know, you're opening yourself up to a different um, group of Mm. consumers. Um, But I I think some adjuncts are actually added to increase the alcohol content. And I mean, yeah, like, you can't just say this, that, or the other, like, there would be a wide variety of why uh, companies would do that. But I mean, I suppose that's kind of up to them. (laughs) Mm. yeah but yes certainly some of those higher alcohol like again the the belgian ones that candy sugar you're gonna start to creep up there to get to your sort of seven and a half eight percent beers it makes a difference and and what it will often do is that it ups the abv and the fermentable sugars but because it's pure sugar and it's simple sugars it gets fermented right out so it Mm. makes the beer drier as opposed to when you're using more grain which will leave you a bready flavor or a grainy flavor, and it will be um, sweeter. So mm-hmm. often when we're talking about Belgian blondes and Belgian triples, there's often the use of Belgian candy syrup in there to push up the ABV, ABV but they end up being really dry and really refreshing. And to the point that Bel- Belgians have obviously mastered this because you can drink a 9% beer and somehow still want another one. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I think... Um... Another interesting point that Will had made was that there isn't always like um, essential nutrients that an adjunct contributes to, or let's say like the amylase enzymes, you know, like I think it's maybe stylistic and that's part of the art as well as the science, you know, coming together and when brewers choose to use which adjuncts and why. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you might um, you might find different ingredients, like for instance, wheat and oats, which have got quite, quite a high amount of protein in them. Um, they'll add things to your beer that are not just flavor, but they'll add haziness and they'll add body and, and add mouthfeel and 
you know, various um, other bits and pieces, which may or may or probably does change the way that it's fermented or adds to that specific yeast's particular, you know, Goldilocks zone of, of stuff to eat, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's interesting. So Lisa, how have adjuncts been perceived in the world? Yeah, so it's an interesting one because for a long time, and I'll, I'll say a long time is sort of 10 to 15 years in, in what I'll call kind of um, early craft beer. So you're sort of late 1980s, early 1990s, adjuncts were bad, you know, capital B. And because, you know, your, your corn, your rice are associated with, oh, your, your Budweiser's, your big macro beers. And, the, and there was this sort of um, received wisdom, if you like, that came out, that came about that this was something that came around after prohibition because everyone was brewing on the cheap. And, uh, and it, you know, it completely makes sense because it, it, it is cheaper. You do get, you know, the consistent flavor you're trying to make again, whether that's good or bad is again, subjective, but this sort of myth was completely false because you have had corn and sometimes rice as well, but especially corn in North American brewing from the earliest uh, European brewing. So we're talking, you know, sort of 17th century. Uh, the Dutch are doing it even before the English turn up in North America. So this has gone on forever because again, what's your most available fermentable sugar? In this case, it was corn. So it has actually been there sort of, you know, twas ever thus, if you like. And it was actually very, very common when the, the first sort of German brewers turn up in the 1820s, well, we'll say 1830s through the sort of 1850s, 60s, one of the reasons they go to those parts of North America is because they can brew with corn. It, you know, it's it's cheaper, but they're turning out a consistent product. So it's, uh, you know, this wasn't something that they, you know, just happened later because of, you know, capitalism or, or anything else. Like it was just sort mm. of a natural thing, but people sort of conveniently forgot about this when you started to get into, you know, again, those early craft beers, which were, you know, certainly a reaction against those kind of very bland macro loggers, but they sort of looped all, or sort of lumped all of these things together, if you like, sort of brewing with corn or any adjuncts, bad. So if you had shown some of these people in, let's say, 1991, a pastry stout, like that their heads would have exploded because they would have just been like, that's not beer. And, you know, maybe they were right about some of that. But uh, it's it's interesting. So I, I wrote an article for Serious Eats about this now. This is like 12 or maybe even 15 years ago now about how there's this really long history of using adjuncts mm -hmm. in North American brewing that then, you know, ha has now gone out to the rest of the world once sort of it became okay, if you like, in craft brewing. But uh, it took a while to get there because people still had this kind of fake history that uh, adjuncts were bad. But I think what's more interesting too is kind of the, the flip side of it is it's so Eurocentric. Again, we talked to Jesse from Queza thinking about, you know, if sorghum is your most, you know, accessible thing, that's not an adjunct if you're brewing with that. That's your day to day. And, you know, to look at it through this very kind of, you know, sort of, if you like German English lens of, oh, no, it must be this. Uh, you, you know, it's sort of, you're, you're canceling out all of these other options by saying that they don't count as, you know, the right thing. So it's, it's yeah. so subjective again. And it's so about what are you used to? What do you have, you know, in your local area? And again, very different in Asian brewing where rice is there. People are making sake and then, you know, you can also make, make, beer with with rice you know straight up as well so I, I think again it's uh you know are you looking at it through this very kind of eurocentric american centric lens and uh, mm. in that case you know there are no adjuncts we're all friends so <laughs> and, and i think even apart from accessibility or availability um climate change and yeah. sustainability absolutely have an added layer to that now it's like well what can we actually grow in yeah. this weather or not um Absolutely. It's it's so dependent on what's around you, what's available, what makes the most sense. I mean, yeah. you know, just the same way that um, craft breweries in Africa and I, in, I'm going to presume South America as well, but certainly from what I know in Africa, people are trying to use as many local ingredients as possible. Not only is it, you know, potentially more authentic and, you know, all of that sort of thing, and it's more unique, but it's more cost effective. Mm -hmm. Why on earth would you import all of your ingredients if you have th the same or equivalent ingredients, but they just taste a little different mm -hmm. local to you? You know, yeah. use what use what's around you um, and make interesting beers that people can't find anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's got to be, you know, the local palate too is going to be adapted mm -hmm. to, to that. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's, I, I think we have, 
I think we're really lucky here in Ireland to have, you know, some small brewers who can do the full kind of, you know, grain to beer, um, you know, really do like properly drinking locally, like cut down on all those air miles for the ingredients. That's not to say there's none because there's always going to be something that you have to import or even if it's just to, you know, drive 40 kilometers, but uh, you, you know, absolutely from a sustainability perspective, I think it's, it's, it's important to start to think about that. And that was something I saw someone actually tweet today as I was doing some, uh, some research saying, you know, if, if you do have this big list of adjuncts, are you sourcing those on your can? Are you saying where these came from and that they were responsibly grown, acquired, you know, all, all of these things. So it's, it's another question and you don't want to put all the onus on the consumer on these things. Although I feel like as the consumer, it is always or almost always up to us to figure these things out, but it's really <laughs> great. Again, if you can have that transparency and say, we worked with this local cooperative or, or whatever it was to, to get this product. And this is why it's a great product. Mm. So what I was thinking about there was that there are a lot of different kinds of adjuncts. So we've spoken about the broad categories, but I might just go over there a little bit of when you would add different ones mm -hmm. or what the possibilities are, mm -hmm. because I'm not going to be prescriptive. Everybody can experiment. Um, so there are kind of different ways that you'll add your adjuncts in. The first one, which often captures the cereals and the grains is pre, -fer like pre-mash. Now, the reason that I say pre-mash is that for most beers, you'll be mashing in, whether it's a single infusion or a decoction. Uh, go listen to our lager episode for that. Um, there is ways that you can add your grains into the mash, but often these, um, often these adjunct grains need extra special care. So for instance, um, corn and rice, for instance, and a few others, they need to be gelatinized and they need to be kind of they need to go through a, a period beforehand of being heated up very gently at low temperatures because you can't just put them into 65 degree Celsius water and expect for them to miraculously part ways and give you, give you their sugars. They need to be coaxed really, really gently. So there is often something called a, like a, a rest, you know, like a cereal rest um, that people will do. And that's before you even get your mash on. So that's just so that you know, there are some grains that need that kind of love. Some grains can just be added in, you know, with your normal, uh, with your normal grist. Some grains do make it harder to sparge. So think of really gelatinous things like wheat and oats. They can make your, um, your mash very sticky, very gelatinous, very thick and very viscous as opposed to a fairly thin one. So often people add in things like rice holes, which will add almost extra, I think of it as like fiber, extra fiber to separate all the little grain bits out and make the flow of water better through the sparge. And um, then you get some that you'd add in to the boil. So lactose is one of those. Um, you can add honey into the boil as well. So adding some of those would often sterilize the ingredient, which is one thing, but it's often just what's needed to be able to process that thing for use by the yeast. Then you'll do some things when you're cooling your wort down. So when you're doing your chill and that, that's going into your fermenter and heads up to Lewis from Whiplash, who told me that the best way to add coffee to a beer is to use firstly, like a cold brewed coffee. So you steep your grains in water for 24 to 48 hours. And then you add that in when the beer is cooling down and into the fermenter. So if you add it into the hot side, he says, it can become a little bit um, acrid, tannic, a little mm. bit heavy. So, so that's pretty interesting. And I wonder if a lot of people who don't like coffee beers, Lisa, looking at you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't like coffee Carolyn. beers either. <laughs> yep. And I wonder if that's a process thing as opposed to a flavor thing. That, that's an interesting one, yeah? Mm. So what about fruits? Or are you getting mm. there? <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> no, I was, totally, totally good question. I've heard numbers of ways to get fruit in. Um, I've, I've seen some people do it in the boil. Uh, but for me, that always seems like a weird way to do it because I feel like you're going to break everything down. Um, the other way that people do it is to almost treat it like a dry hop. So when your beer is in the fermenter, to add that in so that it imparts all the flavors without any of the heat, um, you okay. would sterilize them in some or other way first. I think you actually, you can make jams out of your fruit as well, which would boil them, and then you can add them in later. Um, but you can also just use them 
as like a dry hop. Um, not fresh. Just sterilize them. Otherwise, you'll right. ruin your beer. <laughs> Interesting. Mm. Uh, so, so there are almost those kinds of things. There is also one last way that you might use different kinds of adjuncts, and that is to carbonate your beer. So I did this recently. I carbonated a pale ale with honey. So when I bottle condition, um, because I'm not kegging at the moment, long story, but anyway, when I'm bottle conditioning, typically you'd add sugar to give the last remaining yeast a little bit of extra food so that it carbonates the beer with a cap on and you've got all the right stuff going. Well, on the day of bottling, I realized I had no sugar, so I had to use honey. But honey is a great um, way to bottle carbonate your beer because it doesn't add a whole lot of sweetness. It, it ferments really dry. So it can also be a way to get um, to get a slightly drying effect out, which is kind of cool. And that was one other last thing was that I wouldn't expect, if you are homebrewing, I wouldn't expect that whatever you're adding in, in terms of your adjuncts, is going to come out tasting like that. So, for mm. instance, with honey, if you add it into the boil, it'll add fermentable sugars, but it's going to ferment right out. If you add it when you're uh, almost dry hopping or fermenting, it can add a bit of a honey sort of sweetness. If you're bottle conditioning, it probably could, depending on how much you add, but it can also really dry out, depending on how much yeast is there. So it's weird. It, it blew my mind, actually, that if you add something sweet like honey, it doesn't always come out sweet like honey. It comes out dry like saison. That's, you know, it's a weird one. And in a way, it's the same. If you're adding donuts into your mash, <laughs> <laughs> it probably will come out quite sweet, but don't expect it to. I think that's the point. Could you have used maple syrup in that way, do you think? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you can use a lot of different kinds of syrups, whether they come from trees or plants or whether they're coming from your own your own making. But um, depending on how much yeast is left, how healthy yeast is, it might dry out completely. So you'd have to do some calculations if you wanted that flavor in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so those are the kind of the different places that you might add an adjunct. The very, very last one, I guess, is something like what Erica mentioned there earlier about process process adjuncts, like adding oak chips then removing them, which almost mimics something aging in an oak barrel. And I wonder if there are any other ways to mimic a process that effectively add a flavor. Um, but that one was interesting to me. Uh, question. Yeah. Yeah, and I was also wondering uh, if, you know, some of those non-malted barley uh, adjuncts, if they would require like different settings on the mill, or if mm. they would get stuck, or also like with the spent grain that's going to the livestock, like, do they have preferences for different <laughs> grist mills, the animals? That's a really good question. <laughs> These pigs will not accept, you know... <laughs> Whatever your flake goats, or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, thank you. Too spicy. <laughs> and and um, just on that, because we spoke about process a little bit, but one of the things that brewers did tend to use, and some still do, but in clearing beer, there are things that you can use. Yeah. So one is Isinglass, which is like it's almost like a fish gelatin, mm -hmm. um, seaweed, isn't it? It's not fish. Is it fish? It's That's their fish. it's their swim bladder. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, one is there fish. We go. Mm -hmm. That one's fish. Are, um, you, are you thinking of carrageen? Carrageen is the vegetarian one, isn't it? Yeah. Or is, yeah. That's, that's more like, like a but that's moss. the seaweedy one. Yeah. It's moss yeah. seaweedy. Yeah. yeah. And Irish moss. That's the one I was actually mm -hmm. thinking about. Mm -hmm. So Irish moss is a plant, but it helps to coagulate and clear the beer. Um, and and people might people have filtered their beer through the weirdest things too. So <laughs> so one of those, you know, if if you are a strict vegan you know, just make sure to look out for strictly vegan beers because not everything that's used in the process of beer is always yeah. vegan. Yeah, and I, I think that would definitely be something for oyster stouts. Like, they would have to uh, declare on the label. I think they do because of, like, shellfish and crustacean allergies mostly, but mm. that is that is another, that's such a weird adjunct, is mm. adding oysters to a beer. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it does I'll add pass. <laughs> and I've also had oyster stouts that have nothing to do with oysters where maybe they've had, you know, there's some kind of like almost wash over like 
you know, empty shells or something. But, you know, again, you don't know unless it mm. is very clear on the label. So. And then I also wonder with in addition, such as some kind of nut, maybe macadamia nuts, like mm. uh, could someone who's allergic to eating nuts um, have a similar reaction to drinking beer that had, you know, a tiny amount of nuts in it? I'm not mm. sure. Yeah, I wonder what the threshold is. Probably mm. depends on the person. Yeah. What What are some of your favorite adjuncts? Ooh. I mean, macadamia nut, I think of the Lockgill McNutty, uh, yeah. just because I, I love a brown ale anyway. I, I don't know, to be fair, that I taste a, a lot of macadamia nut flavor, but there is a little bit of a of a nutty character, and it's just a really good brown ale, but mm. uh, I, I have to say I'm really enjoying this 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 Hogan beer. I'm, I'm not always a big rye fan, but to your point before about, you know, how maybe, depending on how you handle it, it can be too tannic or, or similar. This is not like that, so really... Uh, really enjoying it in this case. Mm. Rye is probably up there for me as well. I love rye in anything. Mm. Um, it's fabulous. But I think I like fruit as well. So, I, you know, we've had lots of like nice raspberry, um, Berliner or raspberry sours. And I think it always just adds a lovely flavor. Um, I wouldn't yeah. be super crazy about oysters or things like that. Sure. Yeah, I like fruit as well. I've had a couple of good fruit like wheat beers as well so it's always nice to see what people do with the fruit in yeah. different styles of beer because I think what didn't we have like a blueberry cobbler stout one time like it's just interesting to like see how people put the fruit in beer yeah, and, and I, it. yeah I think um like circling back to Lisa's point about that earlier generation of craft brewers it's almost like now like the more weird and wonderful you are, like the more innovative you are and, you know, people are just willing to try anything. And um, I, I've always been a fan of vanilla and I know that sounds mm. very boring and vanilla, but um, <laughs> I think it has a time and place in beer, uh, yeah. maybe coriander slash, mm. sure, yeah. slash cilantro. <laughs> um, yeah. I like a Rattler. Um, I like a red re yeah. really sure if that falls into adjunct territory yeah. Bit of lemon. Um, mm. and I've heard about cumin being used I haven't mm. seen any or drunk any of those but I'd be kind of curious to explore more of the the spices like I think I had a a pumpkin beer with jalapeno chilies in it so yeah, yeah. Like Ch chilies are a common one actually mm. had some chili stouts yeah that some have been really good and and i wonder would you would you include the the salt in a goza as an adjunct or is it kind of yeah. again, one of those sort of you know steps in the process versus a an ingredient well, i don't know i mean you have a point because i had a lager that taste it had lime and it had salt in it like it tasted like you already dressed the beer and it was like done it tasted like I guess you're dressing a Corona and you're drinking that with lime and salt and that's what it tasted like. So interesting. So cool. <laughs> huh, it was so good. It, makes, it was good. A lot of I, I would buy it a hundred times over. But when you mentioned salt, that was the first thing that popped in my head is uh, I'm pretty sure they put salt in that to get that flavor. Yes, yeah, so maybe it depends what you do with it. Yeah. And again, mm, I don't yeah. know whether it, again, air quotes, if it counts the salt, and yeah. the saltiness in a Goza versus like in a Michelada or even a pre-mix kind of you know kind of thing that's interesting yeah it was a good is it a beer cocktail i don't know what's the line it's a yeah well i mean it question. had abv high abv so like it wasn't just a... i bet it was a good day though that sounds oh, great especially in the sun great, like great for a hot day i'm like i need more of this <laughs> <laughs> because i live in texas and it's hot it's weird because i i always think i like nuts in a beer but actually, I think I just like it when people use like a nut syrup or a flavoring or something, which mm. sounds awful, but I, th I feel like you actually get a truer flavor from those concentrates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and like adding adding plain old nuts to a beer, depending on how you use it, but it can make it so oily. So you'll mm. often have really poor head retention, a really slick mouthfeel. And I mean, that is just not it. I'd almost rather have the flavor without the texture. Um, interesting. I, I'm the same with pumpkin yeah. spice versus mm. like actual pumpkins mm. as well. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh gosh, actually circling back to cumin, a friend of mine made a curry beer once and I was like, what on earth is she doing? But she made it using curry spices. So cumin and uh, 
maybe cinnamon i don't know but ginger you know all all the, the things that you might find no garlic as far as i know <laughs> <laughs> but um she liked it i never got a chance to taste it not that that was really interesting yeah although i think as we're recording this i think canvas just brewed a beer with garlic so we'll have to follow up and see again what what those crazy lads are up to so uh, well i think at least tandy and i will be in mullingar in june for the right. wild beer festival yeah. and canvas mm-hmm. will be there and i i expect a lot of um fruity adjuncts there yeah um and i i know for april fool's day this year several breweries and brew pubs had jokes up on their social media and there was a curry beer that jw sweetman had on theirs oh. and it actually sounded kind of good yeah <laughs> I, I have had one with curry spices like at like a cask festival where they were like put into the cask versus like brewed with um mm. and again i have to say the one i tried was not not good but you know others maybe but this um yeah interesting experiment it was like it was like oh you tried kind of a <laughs> thing but yeah so what, what beers do we have? What beers do we know of that are really well known or that use adjuncts? Uh, Coors, Harp, <laughs> the Harp Lager. Harp. <laughs> Yingling. Makes sense. Um, what else? Asahi. Budweiser. Um, Tiger, I think. Oh, okay. The, mm-hmm. the Singapore beer or the beer from Singapore. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch. I think it's interesting. I think most, most I, I want to say most beers like I, I want to say the majority of beers are adjunct beers now that I'm like learning more about it at least mm. your big brands yeah your big lager yeah. brands. yeah yeah big lager brands definitely um in South Africa there is Castle Milk Stout which is a very big very popular beer so that'll have lactose um and lots of beers have lactose too many people's absolute chagrin but like um it's, it's one of those things that people love or hate yeah. I mean, I like Guinness, it is Guinness considered an adjunct beer? I mean, I don't, I don't think know. so. Not the mothership so. anyway. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, some of the, some of the very like the nitro maybe, one, maybe. But... Oh, no, I don't, don't think they nitro... have a nitro. Don't they have a nitro? One? Oh, no. But the they do, but the it gas. wouldn't count. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mm. But that said again, especially if you go to the open gate, they do do some, you know, strange one offs. True. Um, which some of which are really good, so well worth uh, giving a shot. So, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, and again, some of them, like uh, thinking of some of the those sort of American loggers. Um, uh, every couple of years, Victory in Pennsylvania does a pre-prohibition American lager that has. I want to say it's like fifty percent, you know, flaked flaked maize basically in the grain bill, but it is a phenomenally good beer. And and again, they're sort of un undoing this lie that oh we didn't have corn pre-prohibition it was like a good 50 percent corn so, something in that in that area and it is a really interesting beer it does not taste at all like a Budweiser or uh, or that kind of thing it's very flavorful kind of a darker lager but really fascinating to see what you could turn out with you know very different grain bills so yeah mm. and I I think that definitely makes sense though in the U.S. because oh, yeah. uh, maize is just so ubiquitous in so much of our food and drink so yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah south africa too i mean lots of lots of corn and maize farms so i don't know for a fact but i'd be willing to bet that our big lagers have got some some level of maize in them wouldn't surprise me yeah well ladies is there anything else we want to talk about on adjuncts are there adjuncts that you would absolutely stay away from <laughs> coffee I do tend to stay away from coffee as well, although I have a, a I have what I call like a crazy pig street stout adjuncty beer in my fridge that I've not tried yet. I'm waiting for an occasion because like a lot of these, it's like 10 yeah. percent or something like that. So I need mm. need an occasion. So. Um, so it's not the coffee. It's actually the percentage. <laughs> it's the percentage, but it's definitely got it. I want to say it's got coconut and some chocolate in it. So it, okay. it's probably going to be lovely. But I'm like, again, I so we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Mm. Um, I'm probably um, the, the least picky eater you'll ever meet. <laughs> um, the only thing I don't like to eat is coconut shavings, but I don't mind them in a beer. Oh, interesting. Um, I'm not a fan of smoky beer, but like I'm not either. Smoke malt itself isn't necessarily an adjunct. So yeah, yeah like um, I, w- I would say I-, I will absolutely try anything once. 
yeah i i think i'm the same as you erica like i'd probably try anything once i'd be very cross if i always had to buy those things and have to finish the whole thing mm -hmm. but i'll share yeah. <laughs> to do a tasting yeah. party but i'll try anything once i'll even try that curry beer if it ever comes out <laughs> if it's ever really made by sweetmans <laughs> but i would i would try it if i try a pickle beer I'll definitely yeah. try a curry beer. Why not? <laughs> for science. For science. Mm. Oh, I thought of for a science. couple actually that I had in um, Prague. Uh, I had at Doom Pivovarsky a uh, banana beer and a nettle beer. I and had some good nettle beers. That yeah, nettle that one nettle was green. Too. Yeah. Yes. So those are definitely adjuncts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like they're in the name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you add food coloring, is that an adjunct? So I was what talking to my friend. You? Well, but well, okay. So that that cucumber lime. He's like, when you, like, it turned out to be like this weird murky green color, and so he added food coloring to make it like a little bit brighter green, so it didn't look gross. Interesting. <laughs> no, it's food coloring it an adjunct, even though it adds no flavor to it. But it does add color. But it adds so, color. That's yeah. part of it is adding color. And there were a couple around Patty's Day here uh, that mm. were mint and watermelon. And <laughs> they certainly didn't get that green on their own. So. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And we <laughs> all know exactly which beer you mean. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, that is one thing I might stick, stay away from is mint. Yeah. Yeah, mint. Not, not I, a fan. I would take watermelon in a beer, but would yes. not. I've had a couple. It's not my thing because I, I don't know. I, but I've tried it, you know, again for science. So, uh, yeah, yeah, for science. <laughs> I've had a nice watermelon beer. It was watermelon lager and it was lovely. Um, but yeah, only, only one or two. I've not seen many. And, and mm. I do like a good, like, beer garnish as well. Mm. So, like, my first would have been maybe like the, the slice of orange in a blue moon. Um, right. Or like the, I think, bought and beer works as well as 21st amendment they have like the watermelon yeah. slice in your watermelon beer and i just think that's a nice touch yeah especially or... 21st amendment and people who are weird and gatekeepy about that can get in the sea because let people enjoy things you know it's, it's absolutely fun. And, yeah. and there's so much room um for making beer cocktails and uh, experimenting 100%. with what works and yeah mm. i like it i like the fact that um as opposed to the Reinheitsgebot, which only, you know, <laughs> told us that we can only use certain things, although go back to that episode to figure out um, just how effective that was. Um, <laughs> you know, as, as, as opposed to that, I think it's great that everybody is experimenting with things and, and sometimes throwing everything but the kitchen sink into a beer. But you know what, if you don't try it, how are we going to know? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> as long as it's safe, then I, yeah. don't, I don't see why not. <laughs> Agreed. Well then, friends, let's call it there. Um, for everybody listening at home, thank you for joining us once again. And just a final reminder to catch us on the socials, wave hi to us or, you know, send us a message if you want. Um, and we're always open to suggestions, topics. Um, if you've got somebody that you'd like us to speak to, you never know. Send us an email or hit us on, on the socials. We will, we will certainly look into it. And... Um, Friends, uh, friends on the pod, not just listening to the pod. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. You too. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Bye. 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 Bye.